migration, we do not speak of culture. We speak of, of context. Uh, of course, culture and context interact. But migration and refugee, it's about context. So it's a situation, and the person may be a migrant or a refugee and may be from the same culture than you are, or different. But it's really talking about an event, a situation, uh, and a translation of one place to another. So this is a, a kind of a drawing that some, when we do program in school, that some migrant kids from Russia did. And it's a drawing about the princess frog. The princess, and for, we, I think we talked about that in the morning. So the princess frog has two skin. There's different version of the myth. But the princess frog has two skin, and it's about uh, losing her frog skin because the prince do not like her frog skin. And he burns the frog skin, which put the princess in danger of dying. And kids were addressing the double identity of, of migrant kids through this metaphor. What is interesting is that a lot of other kids in the class took back the metaphor of the princess frog to explain what they were going through. And as you can see, this, the king frog is saying to this very nice lady who may be from youth protection, saying to, to the lady who are bringing clothes for the baby frog. So the king frog is saying, the baby frog do not need your clothes. He already have a skin. He do not, he doesn't need you. He doesn't need this transformation that you're proposing. So what you could see is how for the kids this was a very powerful story and they were telling their own issue with a double belonging, double and some, sometimes triple or multiple belonging and how they were negotiating that in the host country. Now, uh, in terms of just rapidly, and I will not use this for the challenge of globalization, I wanted to touch the first two points. So, uh, what are the prevailing premises underlying the literature on uh, migration? I use the, the door of children, and we'll see how they apply also for adults. And uh, what about the new paradigms in the literature? Uh, and refugee children, are they overall really an at-risk group? That's true of refugee in general, too. And how can we think uh, the literature in another way again? Uh, so. Uh, the prevailing premises about immigrant family when you speak with clinicians and with a lot of people is about a handicap. So poor mental health, and it depends when, where you are, people will speak of losses, of the cultural shock, of poverty, of minority status and racism. So you heard about that in the last few uh, weeks. And the media representation of ethnicity reinforced this negative uh, portrayal with a lot of stories of, of youth gang. And when you have stories of youth gang, you will say, well, a black gang did that, or a Latino gang said that. And you never have people saying, a white gang did that. It's just a gang. So whenever it's an, a gang from another ethnicity, it's highlighted, and people get the wrong impression that there is an overrepresentation of violence, of problems, of psychopathology in migrant neighborhood. Now, migration uh, used to be a very long journey in which it would take months to go from south to the south of Italy to Canada. It would take, it would be a very lengthy journey, and this is represented in novels and films and so on. And the mail would come kind of three or four weeks after, if not a couple of months, and sometimes you would never heard back of the person. And just remember that the literature which was built around migration and mental health in the 60s is based on these premises. So the whole idea of the cultural shock is based on the idea that this is a very long journey and that you do not have a lot of refueling or ties with uh, your country of origin. So kind of travel, which 
represented migration was linked to that. And what presently represents the reality of our migrant family here is more the Skype type of interaction, uh, which I don't know how many of you are migrants. I am. Uh, how many of you stay in contact with their families through Skype? Quite a few. Uh, and, and so refugees who come from all over the world or migrants are refueling with their family. Um, and of course, for, for kids, it's very important because then they do not, you cannot say they've lost their grandparents, they've lost their extended family because they're in, in constant refueling, being in touch, talking about daily issues, small talks, and so on. So the, you can see it as a plus in a sense that the migrants are, haven't lost the extended family or necessarily lost the extended family. It's also a minus. You don't escape your family anymore as easily. You know, it was uh, our friend from Somalia is not there. It was particularly true in a Somali community in Montreal. So the youth would come here as unaccompanied refugee minors and then settle in uh, their life as they could, but they will tell things to their family, embellishing the reality saying, you know, I'm studying, or I'm working so hard, or posing in front of a big car to say, this is my car, and so on. But then the community would know, and their parents in Somali would, would be telling them, that's not true at all. What happened, you know, you've been partying around, you've been doing this, you've been doing that. So the whole idea that the closed network, the closed transnational network, which are functioning, on one hand are supportive, on the other hand, they mean there's no escape from your family and community because everybody back home will know everything, <laughs> especially now with the photo and the phone cell and so on. So the amount of circulation uh, which goes around is just incredible. The impact of transnational network of the new forms of communication and, and social media uh, are not yet reflected in the more quantitative epidemiological studies of migration. It's reflected more in anthropological work. But the translation of that into models to study migration, I would say this for the moment hasn't been done. And so you could see that the, the prevailing epidemiological uh, paradigm to structure a lot of the study on migration are still, for example, Barry model of acculturation. Well, Barry model of acculturation have been in some way refined a bit to say, well, it's not necessarily unidimensional, it can involve various domains and so on, but globally there is this idea that you go to a host country and you will eventually acculturate, uh, mingle into, your identity may disappear. With the present communication and transnational network, with the fluidity of communication and travel, it's, it's absolutely not evident that this is a good model to understand the complexity of migration presently. So you see how a number of things which have kind of structured the field may not be valid. Uh, what do we know on migrant families throughout the world? Uh, well, first, there, there are a lot of migrants in the world. Uh, most migrant families are likely to be poor, to live in overcrowded house compared to majorities. Uh, they're more likely than mainstream Western country to live with two parents. And they're more likely to live with large uh, family units, so with a lot of siblings, which in fact is often protective even if it's linked to more poverty, and we will see. Now, there is not a unique health outcome for migrants or refugees. You have a considerable diversity of health outcome. And the whole thing is what push you in one direction or in another is what is important. Recently, I have a, presently a resident psychiatry, and she's reanalyzing some data on pregnant women uh, and perinatal trauma, and perinatal risk, and so on. And, and she was very alarmed uh, yesterday, saying, I just realized that I thought my data was significant, and it is, uh, 
uh, but it's not in a good direction because she expected migrant women and refugee women to be more at risk than Canadian women. And her whole data set is totally twisted in the other direction. Canadian women worry more, are more depressed, are more fearful, uh, experience much more perinatal stress. Uh, the only thing is migrant women and refugee women were poorer, so they had lower income. They consumed less alcohol, and more of them were married or in stable unions. So, but, but the whole risk patterns, all her other indicators, the migrants and refugee women were doing better than a Canadian woman. So she t told me, she was petrifying, I've got it all wrong. <laughs> and, and, and so it's, it's interesting to see how this premises is still shaping a lot of what we read, of what we think, of what we discuss. And what it is in the media, you know, and for those of you who have been in Canada or are Canadian, uh, the whole political discourse now is about uh, migrants are costly to the society. They represent a burden. They represent a burden in terms of health care. They represent a burden in terms of economic. And that's basically not true. Uh, they're more employed than mainstream population, and they consume much less health services. Now, the difference tends to disappear with generations. OK, so what about poverty? This is a very important thing, because you know, uh, socioeconomic status is a key indicator, uh, key risk factor for mental health uh, in the field. Now, repeatedly, Canadian studies have showed that Poverty do not affect migrants in the same way. That doesn't mean that poverty is not painful for migrants or is not a deprivation, a source of suffering. Uh, but Morton Beiser, Ryerson University, and certainly one of the scholars in the field of migration study in Canada, uh, was hypothesizing the difference between a culture of poverty and the contextual poverty which migrant and refugee go through when they arrived. So people arriving here expect to be in poor housing, expect to have it difficult, expect... We, we even passed, at, at some point, we were using the SEL25, you, you know that? So an epidemiological small instrument, Hopkins checklist for anxiety and depression. Uh, and when we made an analysis on a, on a cohort of migrants here, when we made an analysis item by item, we discovered that one of the items uh, which was considered to be a, a depressive item, everything requires an effort, was largely endorsed by 85 or 90 percent of migrants. So these were not people who were depressed. So it had shifted from the fact that in mainstream population, everything requires an effort could be a symptom of depression to the fact that this is exactly what is expected when you're a migrant or refugee. You're expecting that everything will require an effort, and this is not a depressive symptom. It's a life predicament. Everything will be hard. You know it will be, and if you do it and you sacrifice, it's very often for the, for the next generation, so for your children. And it's there that you may have problems. But the first generation has this very powerful mission of sacrificing, enduring hardship, because the second generation will do better. Uh, now, yes, so Beiser had these uh, comments about the difference between the culture of poverty and the expected precarity. Uh, in Quebec, and I'll go more in detail, we had no SES effect for immigrants nor for refugee, in spite of very wide difference with the host country population. And in the UK, the studies by uh, Goodman and Patel, Vikram Patel will be here for the Advanced Study Institute, are very interesting. Uh, Vikram Patel was highlighting what he called the Indian paradox in the UK, where in fact what they found in a very large epidemiological study is that the uh, Indian kids in UK, immigrant, had much less behavior problem uh, than their peer of the host country. 
So what they were saying is, why is that? And because Vikram Patel is a very strong epidemiologist, he uh, controlled for any sources of variations or difference between the UK sample and uh, the migrant Indian sample, and the difference persists. So his hypothesis, I'll, I'll, go, I'll come back to that after, just to give you another example. So healthy migrant hypothesis, these are two, two samples of refugees, uh, people whose family have undergone a huge amount of trauma. And you see that the income of their Quebecois peers is more than twice those of the refugee family. So this is a huge difference for kids who are in the same school. You're speaking of school, uh, of kids who are exactly in the same school milieu. If you look at the risk behavior, the risk behavior in the Quebecois is twice that of the Cambodian or Central American, and the internalization and externalization of Quebecois is also higher, although in the youth report this was at kind of a trend, not really significant, but the parents' report was much, much higher. So the whole idea is, in spite of poverty, not only they do as well, but they do better than their host country peers. So you have really a reversed effect, which is proving true in a number of domains. So why is that? Well, one of the reasons we said was the expectation. Another is, has to do with the selection effect of migration. So people think of selection bias when you have migrants because you know that to come into any uh, country, you have to undergo a medical exam. And of course, people who have strong disability or for example, a severe mental illness like schizophrenia will be excluded. So people tended to say, okay, there's less uh, mental health problem uh, in migrant because of the selection bias. Well, that's, remember, that's not always the case. Do you have one example of, of the country of an overrepresentation of mental illness in migrants? No, maybe you're too young. Remember the Maria Exodus. So Maria Exodus is when Cuba, Fidel Castro decided to open the door of Cuba and let people go to the U.S. Well, he didn't let people go. He put on boats for the U.S. all the people who were in the asylum and in the prison and say, please go. And a lot of these people are still in prison in the United States. So that was an example of a migrant wave with a strong overrepresentation of mental illness because in fact they were kind of selected, either antisocial or people with mental illness who were sent to the state as, as a gift. So you, you see that the selection bias can play on one side or on the other side. Uh, among refugees, and people say among refugees the selection bias do not play. Well, that's not true. Richard Molika's studies show that from the people who came from ex-Yugoslavia and Bosnia and were refugee, those who made it were in better mental health than those who stayed. Why? Because you need a lot of personal strength and resources to be able to organize and survive the migration process. Coming to Canada in a container is not a party. It's, you need to be very strong just to survive the process. So the idea is that it's not true to think that in refugee you do not have any type of selection because the host country is not imposing a selection. You have a process of self-selection in which uh, the weaker will probably not make it because they do not have the strength to organize themselves. Now, just be care very careful. What is true at an epidemiological level, the healthy migrant hypothesis can also always be disproved at the level of the individual. For example, an individual uh, person, and now that, that happens, who is maladapted in their country might choose presently migration as a way of escaping relational problem, personal difficulty, and so on. So migration can be a solution for people who have maladaptation problem. So at the clinical level, you may find migrants who are very maladaptated. Uh, 
and have and have problems. One of the reasons of to explain the bias in the literature, thinking linking psychopathology with migration, was that all the first studies in the 60s were mainly clinical studies or clinically recruited sample. So of course, it was a self fulfilling prophecy. Uh, looking at clinical pro population, you would say migration is associated with mental disorder. Now, if you take the general population, this is not true. And again, in clinician mind, very often they have this idea that migration is a source of distress because in the people they see, it, migration or refugee is a source of distress. But this is not true in the general population. So you see, just always remember the difference that Migration and refugee can and are a source of distress and psychopathology, but globally, these populations are not a burden in terms of mental health. Okay, so just uh, maybe the last thing for the Patel and Goodman study, which was quite interesting, they were saying, well, the Indian paradox may be linked to parenting style because and the Indian family structure where the kids are much closer and their requests for autonomy are much less than in the UK. These seems to be more protective family unit than uh, the North American or UK types of family unit where you send the kids uh, out of the home and they have to be independent very rapidly. What they observed is a shift, a turning point at 16. So the kids were protected up to 16. It seems that after the 16, the requirement of an individually centered society became a burden for those kids. So after 16, from 16 to 25, then they were doing worse than their UK peers. And maybe because the, exter the demand from the external world and environment then became a risk, as if they were not well prepared to become, to function in a society where independence is a uh, predominant value. Uh, so, my first point was migration, per se, and refugee even is not a risk factor. Okay? It really depends. It's, it's the condition associated with migration, which may, the specific condition as an interaction process, so not only on the migrant part, on the migrant and the host society, and that's why we're going to look at host society variable, which may make it a risk or a protection. That what, 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 is most, what is the most important uh, in the balance between risk and protection what will emerge is this interaction between the host country and the specific group of migrants. Uh, now, why do most study on migrants say there's no difference with the host country? Because it's like soup. Uh, so some migrants have higher problems than a host community, other have less, and in spite of a global healthy migrant hypothesis, very often if you read the literature, a lot of studies say there is no difference with migrant groups but they're all merged together, uh, very often as if it was a common culture, which is not the case. Now, is there any association between migration experience and specific diagnosis? True in two cases, uh, elective mutism and psychosis. Do, will you have a lecture on psychosis? You had it? Yesterday. Yesterday, so I won't talk about it. What? It wasn't Tuesday. Tuesday, okay, good. Uh, so I won't talk about it, you know, already. Elective mutism is, is an interesting uh, field. More elective mutism in uh, migrant children, and it's a mixture of constitutional factors and relation to language. But again, I don't want to touch that too much. What about second generation children? Well, in one of the study we did here with Caribbean and Filipino youth, uh, what we showed is that the longer the kids having in Canada, the worse they were doing, and that second generation kids were doing worse than first generation. And our conclusion is that the Canadian society was a bit toxic for these kids. But it's important to see that uh, you may have another understanding. So the thing is, is, is there 
is it because it just become like their host country peers? So it just become and act like Canadians or Quebecois or North American? Possible. Is it? And I think the association with racism and perception of racism tend to confirm that because in fact, for second generation, they expect to be considered as Canadian or as Quebecois or as mainstream and they're not. And people still address them as if they were migrant, as if they do not belong, as if they were strangers. So there is a feeling that uh, they can be entitled to be full, uh, to belong fully to the whole society, but they're never recognized as such. And this can, can entail bitterness. I'm from here and still I endure racism, rejection, restriction, and so on. And that may be why second generation. Compared to the uh, Quebecois peer, in the data that we have, they were not doing worst. They were doing the, approximately the same. So, and, and I think that in US studies, which are not on kids, uh, you have the same trend. You know, the Mexican immigrant to the US uh, are doing better and are more healthy than their US counterpart. This is true for all health indicator. Uh, so in terms of uh, nutrition, health habit, general health, and mental health. On all indicators, they're better off than their US counterpart. And at the second generation, this effect tend to disappear. And with the third generation, often it's totally wiped out. And some people in some studies show that in third generation, they may in fact, because of exclusion, social exclusion coming in, become worse because they're just part of the poor and excluded within a big society. But what we observed was that at the second generation, they were not doing worse than their Quebec peers, but they certainly were doing worse than their, the first generation. Yes, of course. Well, in the Caribbean Filipino studies, uh, both groups were considered visible. We didn't have, uh, I would say, European group who would have been uh, more invisible than the Filipino. But even between the, this was English Caribbean uh, kids, even between the Caribbean kids who were black and the Filipino kids, who are Asian, there was a difference in terms of perception of discrimination. So perception of discrimination was higher in the Caribbean uh, children. And the mode of coping, because we also had a whole qualitative study uh, with the epidemiological one, showed in the focus group that, in fact, for the Caribbean kids, they were saying, you know, our parents sacrificed everything and told us, if you educate yourself, you can make it everything is possible. And what we encounter is, it's not true. Whatever we'll do, whatever we, even when we succeed, uh, chances are not equal. And I would say that in the Filipino community, uh, this was not the discourse. The discourse was rather, we came here, our mother were domestic, this is very hard, we do live and endure some discrimination, but we can overcome that, and there is a place for us. So you see how, depending on the skin color, the uh, expectation that their dream of succeeding can really happen is different. And I think that that made a big difference between both groups. Uh, refugee children, so considered as a, as a high-risk group, and again, the clinical premises largely stem from clinical studies of war trauma, post-World War II experiences, and what Kleiman says, a collective gaze on the helpless other. Uh, I don't know, have you read the book, Social Suffering? 97, it's already an old book. This is a, a, a fabulous chapter by Kleiman and his wife. Uh, um, on this photo, uh, this photo, which is a Pulitzer Prize. And you know what they are saying is, uh, okay, this is a terrible reality of this nutrition, 
and you can feel the hurt when you look at the photo. And what makes it worse is the vulture just right aside. Uh, but it's a construction of the photographer because this was taken in a food line, which means the parents are just aside. You know, the kid is not alone. It's terrible. He probably will die, but he's not alone. The construction of him alone and helpless is a construction of the photographer. Uh, and it may be in part the distress of the photographer and the distress of the society of the photographer. So what he's saying, it's both the distress of our society and the power that we don't want to relinquish. So if we construct the other as helpless, we keep the power. We remain hegemonic, helping the helpless other. But it also speaks of our pain and distress, which is projected onto the other. And he went on explaining that the photographer of this, uh, who, who won the prize, did suicide a few years after. So what he, they were saying is it really that stories are, it's kind of pile of story. Whose story is it? Is it, a, it is a story of this poor child. It's a terrible story. It's a partial story because it doesn't speak of the child's family and community who are surrounding him and are excluded. It's also the story of the photographer, but it's also our story of relation to the rest of the world. So you see the, the whole idea of how do we construct refugee? How do we construct the right to asylum? Why do we need a helpless other? And if you hear in the media now in Canada the discourse around refugee, those that we go pick and choose in the refugee camps are the real refugee. And we are really good and benevolent as Canadian. But those who come here by themselves and display some strength, some agency, are probably bogus refugee and criminal. So a good victim is a helpless victim. We're not at all out of Walt Disney, the good, the bad, and the helpless female except that the helplessness is not necessarily distributed as a function of gender. The whole idea is who is the helplessness of the other serving and how do we construct the image of refugee? How do we associate refugee with trauma? Now, I'm not saying that war is a party or do not create trauma. I'm just saying that there is a purpose in this construction of the other. Uh, now, if you look at the literature on refugee, and again, I'm going back to the epidemiological literature, most studies who document very high PTSD, for example, all the study on South Asian in the US, you know, the Cambodian and Vietnamese work, and here too in, with Dr. Beiser work, a huge cohorts of refugee, and they show in the US the sky high levels of, of symptoms. In those studies, very often, the level of PTSD is 70, 80 percent. Those are the survivors of the Pol Pot camp, uh, among others. Now, what is striking is, okay, so you have a lot of suffering. Now, most of these studies also report good social adjustment. That's true for adolescents, it's true for, for adults too. So what does that mean? Does that mean, are these people sick or not? They're certainly suffering, but, but if you suffer, you have pain, but you go on with your life productively. Are you sick or not? Uh, what is it about? Is that psychopathology, I think, is a big question. Or is it that life hurts terribly? So, but that's not being crazy. It's just life hurting. Uh, a number of re very recent studies, among which not longitudinal one, the, the Norway uh, one is a study of the kids of Vietnamese refugee 23 years after the arrival of the boat. So you still have the kids who arrived as infants or very, very young kids. Uh, and then you have all of those who were second generation born in Norway. And they report uh, no more symptom than the host country peers. And sometimes in the case of Norway, even less. They looked at PTSD and then they looked, they had broad skill instruments, uh, which we call dimensional instruments, which look at a wide array of internalization symptoms, which is anxiety and depression, or externalization symptoms like conduct, oppositional hyperactivity. And on both indicators, 
these studies show that the refugee kids have not more and sometimes less symptom than the host country peer globally. Now, in the Norway study, a sub-analysis of the data show that those kids whose father had PTSD when they arrived in Norway have more symptoms than their other peers, than the other Vietnamese peer who arrived at the same time. So it means there is suffering and there is transmission of suffering. But let's be careful. They don't have more symptoms than their Norway peers. So you see, it's, it's, it's very important when you look at a study is what are we comparing to who? It's exactly your question. So second generation have more symptoms, but do they have more symptoms than Quebec kids? No. These uh, Vietnamese kids have more symptoms than their peers if their father were traumatized, but they don't have more symptoms than the Norway kids. Again, a very puzzling feel, uh, finding, which kind of deconstruct this global image that people take for granted that refugee really are doing terribly. Uh, this is just not true. Uh, so, and it brings back, the, the, it brings forward the need to understand the complexity of risk and resiliency process, and I'll try to illustrate that with a couple of, of examples. Uh, so, here in Quebec, we did a longitudinal study of Khmer refugee adolescents, and throughout the study, for the four year we followed them, they globally had less risk behavior than the Quebec peers. Uh, and at time one, we found something and we thought we had a big uh, mythological flaw, that family trauma protected from externalization and risk behavior. So the more traumatized the family had been, the better these kids were behaving. And, and people first told us, you're really crazy, you know, this is not possible. Because we have integrated this trauma paradigm, that trauma produces psychopathology. Uh, it remained for the four years, but on different indicators. And this was very coherent. So they were performing better in terms of school, learning better, uh, had less, uh, less of this, less of that, and so on. So what you could see is over time, they were really a group which was doing better than the other. Does it mean that it doesn't hurt? It doesn't mean that. And I think we had two hypotheses coming from our uh, key informants. The first one was the overcompensation hypothesis is they had to succeed for those who died and were not buried properly. So this is a not, you know, according to uh, the Khmer Rouge not only uh, killed uh, millions of people in Cambodia, they forbid that these people be buried according to the Buddhist ritual, which means that the spirit of these people were wandering, they were not well dead. And, and how can you honor and repair after? And I think that one of the things which was transmitted and is transmitted to the Khmer second generation after the Khmer uh, genocide was you have to do well for all those who died this way. Uh, very similar to what happened after the Holocaust with the idea that if you look globally at the Jewish community, they are they didn't do poorly after Second World War. When they went to Germany to say, uh, we want compensation because our people have suffered so much. What did Germany say? You don't need compensation, you're doing very well. And, and uh, you know, this is important because Norman Sartorius from the World Health Organization was saying, compensation should not come because of symptoms. Compensation should come when something terrible in human have happened. It's not because you're sick that you should be compensated, because otherwise you prescribe sickness. We often do that. Just like in refugee, when if you're traumatized, if you have PTSD, it means your story is true. That's absolutely not, not uh, exact. Uh, it doesn't mean because you've, not, you've endured something terrible that you should have PTSD. It is, there is a relation, it's not an automatic relation. Absolutely not. So the whole idea that overcompensation probably protected them, and then there is a resistance hypothesis that the Khmer Rouge project was really to make this culture and tradition disappear. And these youths and children were telling us that they 
They needed to thrive and make their culture and roots thrive. Maybe these appear in second and third generation. We can talk about it after. But they had this impression, just like the Jewish identity was cherished and was kind of reinforced after the Holocaust, because people needed to say, this is our flag, this is the way we belong, and they wanted to us to disappear, and we will not go there. Uh, now, again, what I want you to think is, it's never a linear unidirectional process, even group-wise. And a subgroup of girls had increased internalization just in post after puberty. When we ask our key informants, uh, Khmer, they said, we don't know why. And then we said, well, you know, in the camps in Thailand and in the boat, which a lot of people took to escape, there was a lot of rape. Now, rape was not possible to address even with our key informers and colleague. They said, well, you may be right. Very difficult things have happened. And when we went to the girls and to the family, the girls were telling them, us that in the family, the mom will tell them constantly, be careful, don't go out, you're going to be raped. Well, Montreal is not really a dangerous city, and almost nobody gets raped when they go in the street. You know, it's a very safe city. Uh, even decades ago, it has always been. So you can see how at a certain moment of time during adolescence, post-puberty, there is a reactivation of the trauma which may manifest itself through anxiety in a given group, gender specific. The whole idea is not to make generalization, not to think that this group is globally doing well or globally doing poorly. There's the whole idea that even collectively, and I'm not even speaking of individual differences, even collectively, you have very complex way in which the risk or the protection uh, processes will be working. Now, another example for the refugee, and maybe we'll uh, stop that with that more general aspect of the lecture is the uh, example of Somali unaccompanied minor. That's an ethnographic and qualitative study we did both in Addis Abeba and in Montreal. Um, and that came, this study came out of a clinical question. So the social worker who were welcoming the unaccompanied minors in, in Montreal came to see me and said, we have a lot of problem with those youths. And I said, well, what's the problem? And they said, well, they're very aggressive with the, so the female social workers, and we put them in foster home and they ran away. Uh, and that's a problem. I went to the community and said, you think there is a problem with those youths? Oh, they say, well, you know, it's normal that they run away because their dignity is not respected. And for that same reason, uh, they're aggressive with the female social worker. If they were treated properly uh, and respected, uh, they wouldn't do that. So I said to the community, so you think there is a problem? And I said, yes, there is a problem. They drink alcohol and they eat pork. So you see the definition of the problem by the community and by the whole society was dramatically different. So we went in Addis Abeba and in Montreal to do this study. And what did we find? We found that in Somali, the person who is uh, a Wayo Arag, is the one who've traveled a lot, uh, is a wise person. This is associated with wisdom. And that when you grow up, Traveling and traveling on your own is associated with autonomy and with the fact of becoming a man, mostly because of those who travel alone are men more than women. And that in the past, young, young boys, uh, even pre-pubertal, were sent with, with the camel herds uh, to travel far from their family. And that was a way of growing up. And in the dry season, to be sure that the camel would have water and pasture, you need to be very mobile and to intimidate your adversary. And then discussing with the community, I discovered that the strategies the young men were using in Montreal were, in fact, traditional strategies to survive in dry season. You intimidate your adversary, the social worker, <laughs> and you become very mobile. <laughs> you run away from the group home. 
uh, some were absolutely expert and could, could uh, uh, move in between Montreal, uh, Toronto, and Ottawa in a very nice way. So what you see is that this was not delinquency. This was using traditional strategy. Now, because this traditional strategy in the host country, in Canada, were considered as delinquency, they could put these young men into danger because they would be treated as delinquent. So you cannot condone and say, okay, this is, this is cultural, thus it's good. Because in a Canadian surrounding, if you do those things, you'll have problems. So, but, but, but it's not like it should not be interpreted, and the intervention is different from delinquency. They were just using strategy which, to their community, were considered acceptable. Uh, so the whole idea that resilience is collectively constructed around, in that case, the common dream of migration. So in Addis Abeba, they would have groups of youth who endlessly, evening after evening, would imagine their migration to Canada and recount a successful story. What did you tell them and what, how did it happen and so on, while chewing cat and so on. So really the idea of a common dream who supported the migration process and the mission. Now, again, always think a dream can always become dangerous. And some of them were ta talking to us uh, about youth who in that process, probably with the help of a shot, uh, which is a, a stimulant and a bit hallucinate, uh, hallucinogenic herb, uh, uh, developed psychosis. So there was some induced psychosis uh, in the group. And then they would talk about the fact that this person had fallen into their dream. So the whole idea, when is a migration dream supporting you, holding you in a process while you experiment adversity, uh, holding you up to a success of your migration process, and when does it become too much, the dreamlike space, and when does it become a risk? Yeah, I'll help you. Maybe we can stop a few minutes before, uh, first because I want you to choose what we're going on to, and then to see if you have comments or questions on that first part. So, Basically, two premises. Migration is not per se a risk factor, neither is refugee. And trauma, just like any other factor in the migration process, can be a springboard uh, which can lead you to do better than others or a handicap. Most of the time, it will be both. Always painful a handicap in some aspect of your life and maybe a springboard in other. So always think din dynamically and really going out of the global psychological, psychopathology model of migration and also rethinking the premises like the acculturation paradigm, saying, thinking this is not happening like this for the moment. So just remember that maybe when you read the migrant or refugee literature. So it can be seen, and you're bringing it as a source of difficulty, complexity, challenge, and eventually problems. Uh, some migrant kids, those which we don't see in the clinical space, also see that as a richness. Uh, even within Canada, kids who said they were mixed Cree Inuit and they said you know it's fabulous I can see the world the Cree way and the Inuit way so when does the complexity becomes a source of problem and then is it a two or more than two if we do the biography of the people in the room you'll see that for a lot of you probably you have much more than two culture in your own background uh, and I would say that can come from your birth and your genealogy, your genogram, but it, it also comes from your uh, reconstruction identity. So I think we can speak of identity of origin, which are the numerous country, religion, ethnicity, color of your skin, 
and so on, which you are born with. Then you have identity of reconstruction, and these are the identity that you may adhere to. For example, uh, young Caribbean boys here may choose a black identity. Well, in Jamaica or in the Caribbean, they don't have a black identity. Everybody is black. A black identity is an identity which has to do with black Americans. So it's a borrowed identity which have a set of culture, which have a set of representation, a code of dressing, and so on. So the whole idea, when do you borrow somebody else's identity as a third identity? The same with a Latino identity. Uh, a Latino identity, you know, nobody in, in Argentina or Central America will have a Latino identity. The Latino identity is a reconstruction identity in a third space, which is a state, or which is Canada because people, it's also an attributed identity. So when people tell you, you are Latino, are you Muslim, are you this, are you that, so you've been project, are you Arab, you're projected, uh, an identity is projected onto you, and you may choose to adopt it or to resist it. You could say, this is me or this is not me. Uh, and I would say, if you listen, do you go in the metro sometime? I know it's, it's being, terrible the metro the last weeks here in Montreal, but if you get in the metro and you listen to young people speaking among themselves in the metro, it's fascinating to hear them code switch. Uh, for example, they'll speak a bit of French, a bit of English, a bit of Arab. Uh, or, and then it's, it's, so very often the codes in which they manage are more than two, especially in a place like Montreal, where you have two, the interaction between different uh, universe. The whole idea is that these second generation children navigate in between, I would say, mostly more than two identities. Uh, so again, the whole model of the dual identity in the literature is an imposed simplistic model. And each of these identities they can use as a springboard, a special permission to do this or that, and it can become a problem. So when is it a source of exclusion and social exclusion? And I'm not saying that migrants in our society are welcome, just like they're not so much in Italy, and, and they may endure discrimination. But when does it become a source of exclusion, and when does it become a source of pride and belonging? And it's very interesting when you, when you look at young people or at community, how they navigate through that. If you go to Park Extension in Montreal, where the South Asian community is, where I, I work, uh, when I have research assistant going in Park X in, in the neighborhood to interview families and so on, at night, very often the police will stop and say, what are you doing here, young lady? This is a dangerous neighborhood. You should not go and walk by yourself because that's the perception of the police. If I speak with a family in Park X, uh, the South Asian family where I live, about the neighborhood, they say, this is the only place in Montreal where we feel really safe <laughs> because but the rest of the city is dangerous. So, so the whole idea is, yes, youth in second generation will experience exclusion, which they feel is unfair because they were born and they're citizen. And that touches third level of identity. So identity of origin, identity of reconstruction and adoption. And then you have political identity. Political identity is about citizenship. So and what are the rights and which right do you have? And do you have any rights? And according to who? So I would say that's the third level. Because they're citizens, full, and they were born in the country, they're entitled to a certain range of rights, which very often they do not accede to, because they are and still not. They belong and still are considered as stranger. And that is, as you said, a source of problem. But just think that in some second generation kids, and probably some of you are second generation or third generation kid, it will uh, your multiple belonging will foster typically an interest in transcultural psychiatry <laughs> 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 or diversity or no no but it's uh, it's 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 fascinating how 
how most of us have uh, a very mixed background often, you know? So always thinking that dynamically. All what you said is true. What I'm just saying is true but partial. So it's true that second generation may have more problem, more problem than first generation, and that they do experience exclusion, but always think that it's also an opening of perspective and possibility, and that just maybe walking out of the dual culture paradigm, that two culture are opposing. There may be two main culture, but they're very often more than two culture. Just think of the youth culture and the new social media. So the youth can belong to um, uh, an Algerian culture and to the Quebecois culture and to the Canadian culture, which is a bit difficult. Very often the migrants don't know exactly what the Quebecois culture is and what the Canadian culture is and what the North American culture is. So you see even that is, is uh, blurred, I would say. Uh, but then they can be gone, be, belong to the youth culture through internet and video games and so on. And that's a whole other ball game. No, 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 but it's, the, it's, it's not, it's, it's absolutely not. I have a young uh, patient who, their group of belonging is their uh, group of peers from China, Africa, Asia, and Latin America with who they play a specific game and they feel they really belong there. They have a special name there and this is a place in society where they're not excluded. Uh, but it's a transnational group of people we've said never met face to face. But it's, it, it would be foolish to say that these do not play a key role in their identity. It has a central role in their identity and it can be very protective or very destructive. Okay. Uh, you know, my colleague, I had a colleague, uh, Deo Gracia uh, Bajilisha, who comes from Rwanda. And he was a wonderful storyteller. And he used to say, when we talked about trauma, he always told me the story of the goat. And the goat was pregnant, and she was expecting cubs. And she was very happy and saying, oh, I will have a cub, and I will have a cub, and this is wonderful. But then she delivered two cubs. And that was dramatic, because she was expecting one. Uh, she began complaining, and the whole village is terrible. I have two cubs, I have two cubs, and the village complained with her. And then one of the cubs died. Well, it was terrible. She just had one. And, and she went on complaining and complaining. The, the story, and I won't go into the whole story, but the story tells us a few things. First, trauma can come from too much, so too much choices. <laughs> it, can be it can also come from too little. And finally, it's just through trauma transmission to the whole village that it gets results.